Okay, guys, so today we're going to look at section one, which is the unseen section of the exam. Yesterday, we had a look at uh, what, question one, which is worth five marks, and I suggested you write about three quarters of, a, of an exam booklet for that answer. Don't spend too much time on the low mark questions. Of course, do, do write some, do write, but don't sort of waste time on those questions when you've got a 12 mark one coming up. Okay, so this is the um, an outline of all the key concepts that we're going to be using to answer those questions. Um, we've studied the frames and this is a summary of all the frames. You have your structural, your subjective, your cultural and your postmodern frame. It also has a summary of art making practice, the material practice and the conceptual practice. So we looked at this back in term one this year. Okay, and there's a summary of what material practice entails and what conceptual practice entails. And um, then there's the conceptual framework, which we looked at in great detail when we were looking at um, Banksy and Bill Viola. So, you know, it's basically the connections between, you know, the artwork and what's going on in the world or the artist and their life and the artwork or the um, artwork and the audience, how the audience interacts with the artwork. So it looks at these connections, okay? And uh, usually um, a question will ask you to talk about two of those connections, not the whole lot, because that would take too long, okay? So this is um, the sort of uh, little summary of all the key concepts, and it comes in handy when we're looking at section one. So section one, let's have a look at that. So. Okay, so yesterday we looked at the five marker and we all decided that it was a subjective frame question. So because we've already answered a question on the frames, the other questions will have to be either art making practice or conceptual framework. Okay, oh, did she make it? Oh no, that was just, well, that was just my... Um, Outlook Express making a noise. Okay, so, right. So this particular artwork, we discussed it in quite detail yesterday through the subjective frame. Oh, Patricia. I knew there was someone else. Hey, Patricia. Hi. I'll just wait for her to connect. I'm actually recording this lesson because Christiana's not here either. So you only missed a few minutes. Okay. So um, yeah, you haven't missed much. I'm just going over section one. Okay. Okie doke. So section two, it took us a while, but we worked out that this question was what I'm going to ask you guys. And the question is identify how these art works reveal the artist's response to their world. Key words there. What would that be, Vicky? What sort of question is that? Well, it says identify. That's the main word to look at because it's what you got to do. Yeah. And what are some other key words? There's, there's three other key words the, there. Um, reveal the artist's response. So, so artists. Wouldn't it be conceptual framework? Yes. Yes, it's the conceptual oh, I framework. I thought you were with the question. Yeah, look at these words. Artworks, artists, response to their world. Okay, so go back. Look at the conceptual framework, guys. It's got artworks. It talks about the world oh. and the artist, okay? So when you answer that question, you can That's cannot okay, Miss Angus was trying her very, very best. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear well so when you answer that question and you don't know what to do I'm going to allow you uh, access to this so you'll have one of these in your exam kit and it's like oh I don't know what to talk about oh well you could talk about 
the artist, you know, their approach to art making, for instance, what are their ideas and where are they coming from? What do they document? What do they document? What, how do they document events and ideas? What materials do they use? What point of view is being demonstrated? Um, it asked about the world, what it says about their world. Um, what is the artwork about? When was the artwork created? What was happening in the world at the time? What was the spirit of the time? Um, what technical advances could have influenced the work? So these are some of the questions you could mention, not all of them, just the relevant ones. And the other thing they, they were talking about was the artwork. Is it traditional or is it um, temporary or fragile or time-based? What materials and techniques have been used? What type of artwork is it? What are the views and ideas that you can see in the artwork? Where is it displayed? You know, is it outdoors? Is it in a gallery? So when you realize that this is, these are the sort of things you need to talk about in section one, it doesn't matter that it's unseen because you can just gather information by looking at the image, but also looking at this, looking at when it was made. So the 1970s, you may not know anything about the 1970s, that's fine, but you also look at what it's called, the Pont Neuf wrapped in Paris, okay? And it's made of woven polyamide fabric, which is like um, a nylon of some sort and rope, okay? So already it's sort of like telling us this is not a conventional artwork. It's not even in a gallery and it's a bridge. Like it's a big, great big work. So it's an installation, okay? So then you look at this one. This is a, an artwork by the pop artist Andy Warhol. It doesn't matter that you don't know he's a pop artist. We do know that he's American and they're Campbell's soup can. So really, it's just about everyday life, okay, isn't it? And it's just ordinary subject matter. And then we go down here to Michelangelo, and we all know Michelangelo. And this is a painting uh, called The Creation of Adam. So it's a biblical story. Um, and it's in Rome, in the Vatican. It's actually on the ceiling and um, of the Vatican. And um, it's very famous. Uh, she's here. Yes. Yes. Um, so if we are to get similar questions like this in the exam, right, these are the short answer ones. They're not the, yeah, it's not the extended, but... Okay. Um, for questions like this, could you like talk about all areas of the conceptual framework or on, only the ones that apply? Or like only how, do you, how would you tackle that question? Okay, yeah. so let's have a look. Hi, Christiana, I'm glad you made it in. Did you restart and it worked? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. It wasn't letting me in, Miss, but I'm here now. I know. I think um, I've had a couple of students have that problem. Mina had that problem. I don't know what it is. It's not It's not my password. I think it's you just need to update Zoom. You I, need was, to I was typing it in manually, so I don't know what was wrong with that. Yeah, you st I think you just have to update your computer at least once a week. Yeah, I did. I, re I restarted it and I also updated my Zoom. Oh, okay. That's what it was in that case. You've got to update Zoom. It's a bit temperamental. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm glad you're here anyway. This lesson is being recorded um, so that you can watch the beginning. Okay, so you won't miss out. Okay, uh, Patricia was a bit late too. Okay, so going back to Vicky's question, she said, I don't know what, what do I talk about? Let's go back to the question. Get a highlighter pen and highlight the key words. Now you said identify. I would say the other key words in this question are artworks, reveal the artist's responses to their world. So you actually have to talk about three things, how the artist responds to their world through artworks, okay? And some things you might talk about is what the, what the artwork is made of, okay? Remember how we went back here and we thought, what do I talk about? Well, you could talk about what sort of artwork is it? Is it 
you know, an installation, is it temporary? Obviously it's temporary. You can't leave that on the bridge forever. Is it fragile? Is it time-based? Is it a tradition, traditional work in a gallery? What materials and techniques are used? What type of artwork is it? What views and ideas do you see in the work? See, when you start talking about that, you're automatically talking about the artist anyway, because you're talking about the artist's views and ideas. So what do you think Christo was exploring in this work? Like, what is he doing? Okay. Um, where is it displayed? Uh, you can also talk about the world. Uh, for instance, what could have influenced the artwork in the world? What do you think? What was the spirit of the time? Can you guess by looking at that artwork? Okay. Um, are there any, is there any sort of technical advances that you can see in that work that may have influenced it? Okay, so they're the three things that you talk about. Now, there are three artworks. So, Vicky, you don't have to actually talk extensively about the first one. It's worth eight marks. You've got to talk about three artworks, which means, you know, a few sentences on each should do the trick. Okay, so let's have a look at the first one. So this one is by Christo. It's, it's an actual bridge in Paris that's been wrapped in all this fabric. And, it's, and, the, and you can see that it's all been tied down with rope. Okay. So take a wild guess. Why do you think Christo has decided to wrap this work, to wrap the bridge, to wrap a physical object? What does it do to the object? Like I sort of... Um, I regularly walk across bridges, you know, or drive. When I was driving to work, I was always driving over the Cooks River. There's a little bridge on Canterbury Road that I drive over. Um, I never even give them a second thought, right? We've all driven. Yes. Or walked if I'm being 100% honest with you, I have no idea how I would answer this question. I, I don't know how wrapping a bridge would represent their, like, world and stuff. Okay, so I'm getting to that. If you wrap, if you sudden, if you um, if you uh, every day you walk to school or drove to school and you drove over a bridge, like they're all over Sydney because there's rivers and water everywhere. So, and suddenly it was wrapped. What would it make you do as an audience? What would you think? Would you think, oh, Miss, you'd probably most likely stop and look again because yeah. it's not your average bridge. You would definitely stop and look again. So Chris Doe is basically saying, guys, stop and look at the beauty of our world. Look at the beauty. By wrapping it up, he's making people stop and look because we don't really look at our world very much. We take it for granted. So when it's wrapped, we suddenly stop and think, wow, oh, look at those colours. Look at the beautiful colours. I think this photo was probably taken at sunset because there's a beautiful warm orangey glow on the fabric because, you know, nylon or shiny fabric is quite reflective. So it's got this beautiful sort of golden hue or colour. And look at the shapes. They're beautiful. And there's an arch under each section of the bridge. So you don't notice these things until somebody comes along and wraps it up and makes you look. And it's a little bit like me giving a present and wrapping it beautifully. And even though inside it might just be a box of chocolates, but it's if it's so beautifully wrapped, it sort of shows the beauty of what's inside. So it doesn't matter what's inside. So by wrapping something, we're presenting it and making it quite beautiful. So Christo is actually trying to make us respond to the everyday world and make us look at it and appreciate it. So, you know, even if you didn't know Christo and, and his work, and we're actually going to study him anyway next, you know, in year 12, um, even if you didn't know his work and you sort of made things up and you supported it, you know, that's still fine. So, you know, you're not supposed to know these artists anyway. So you, you can just basically say that, but just make sure that you support what you say. So you could talk about the forms or the shapes of the bridge and how they're accentuated. You can talk about the beautiful colours that are glowing, okay? Um, you could talk about 
you could even go off on a tangent and talk about how in our society everything is packaged and made to look beautiful you know like if you buy makeup it's beautifully packaged but really what does that packet serve it's it's nothing but advertising Okay, so you could be a little bit cynical and you could approach it that way and just say it's a reflection on everyday on our everyday society and how we're obsessed with things being looking good. We even package our own selves. We put makeup on and we we sort of, you know, some people go to the extent of getting Botox and, you know, you could even take it that far. So you could talk about society and how it's obsessed with um packaging and making things look better than they are you know like like you know even if you go to youtube and people on youtube they're all got this crazy makeup right and in the real world no one wears makeup like that so it's about packaging okay um but you could just simply say he's just making us appreciate the beauty of the world can you see how there's lots of different meanings that you can get out of this work and it's very postmodern. There's lots of meanings you can get. But I think um, really Christo yes. wanted to show the beauty of the world. Yes. I don't know if this is right, but like the meaning I got from it was like that, like we're so wrapped up with like our own like stuff. Like we're so wrapped up in consumerism and our own lives that we don't really stop to look at even the simple things like, like Vicky said before, with taking a second look at the bridge, yeah. like just we don't really stop anymore to really look at what's around us. We're Absolutely. more just so focused on our lives. Yeah, I that is pre pretty much the first meaning, and I pretty I'm certain that's what Christo um, actually wanted people to do was just to stop and look at the beauty of everything. And he also he wrapped a lot of things. He wrapped he went to Little Bay um, in the 1960s, which is just past. Marubra, like it's a little, it's a rocky, cliffy sort of beach um, near near the jail there. And he wrapped it with, and he got the help of students, you know, art students and the general public to wrap it. And it looked really amazing. And it's such a beautiful beach, but I don't think people realise how amazing those cliff tops are until you wrap them up. So, yeah, we are so wrapped in our own world that we don't, stop and smell the roses so to speak so yeah that's a really good that is pretty much the first I would say that would be the first interpretation of the work um, and then you could even take it further so can you see how looking at the work and just thinking um, you can sort of come up with a response and the more artworks guys that you're exposed to the more you're able to sort of respond to other artworks so when we have a look at um, Christo when we do because he's one of our case studies in year 12 you can then apply what you learned with Christo to other artworks as well so I try to look at a variety of artworks just to expose you guys to sort of various sort of types of art so that you can respond to this section with a little bit more information okay so having thought about the art like now thinking that way how would we respond to this artwork which is um, acrylic paint and it's basically uh, 32 Campbell soup cans repeated over and over again and they're all the same and it's Andy Warhol's work you know what would you say about Andy Warhol what is he saying in his artwork what's he trying to say and, and how is he saying it like it's very similar to Christo in a way what's he saying about our world Does anyone want to offer a response? So would you talk about the repetition? Yep. Where do we see repetition in our it's world? The same photo, like over and over again. Definitely you talk about repetition. Could we also talk about how like each like frame and each can of soup is like very symmetrical, like everything's in perfect order and like all yeah. that? Yep. So they're very symmetrical, perfect, repeated over and over again. Where do you see this sort of visual image? Well, could you, could you talk about it that it would be like representing like in society how everyone's kind of conditioned to do the same thing and be the same, no one be out of the ordinary? 
Yeah, you could talk about that. You could talk about um, everybody um, sort of being the same. You could even just talk about um, our world. So not only are we, well, we're not all the same, but often we're, we're sort of, um, even at school, we all have to wear the same uniform and sort of kind of behave the same. But even if if you go to, you know, anywhere, if you go to the supermarket, you know, everything's just mass produced and repeated over and over again. So it's really about um, mass production and our, our world of mass production and everything's mass produced and everything's the same. And yeah, Vicky, you could even take it to be a metaphor for how also people are all the same as well. I mean, when I'm not saying everyone's all the same, but you know what I'm saying, that we're kind of conditioned to all do the same thing. And if we don't, often, you know, we get into trouble. Okay, so you could even take it that far. So you could say, yes, I think it's a metaphor. This repetition and sameness is a metaphor for society um, and people. But you could also just simply say it's basically our ordinary world. And um, you could say uh, Andy Warhol is glorifying ordinary subject matter instead of saying uh, you have to, Art has to be about important, special things. It can be about ordinary things that most people see each day because let's face it, most people don't get to go to an art gallery and see beautiful art. So for them, art is just everyday subject matter like Campbell's soup can. So, you know, you can see how there are various meanings you can get out of this work um, just by simply looking at it, looking at the art, how it's made, you know, the visual qualities of it, like the repetition and the sameness, and then thinking, what does this symbolise? What would this mean? What is the artist trying to say? And you can even look at the year it was made, 1960s, you know, that was the beginning of consumerism culture. It was after, well, after the war, people had lots of money, you know, people had television sets and, um, you know, they, they had access to sort of mass produced objects in the supermarkets, you know, supermarkets went around all the time, you know, so they were be becoming very popular, especially in America. I think they became popular in, in Australia in about the 1970s. So most people just went to corner shops and fruit markets and, you know, they didn't, there weren't supermarkets around back then. So you can look at the year and you can sort of think, yeah, that's reflecting society and how all this was very new. So you could even take it as far as that. Okay, so there's that. And then there's this work here, which was painted, oh, a bit of a mistype there, in 1511. Um, it's called The Creation of Adam. And what's Michelangelo's world there? What would you say about this, this work? How does it reflect, how does his painting, what the subject matter is, how it's painted, what's it saying about his world? And who, and who might he have painted it for? He didn't paint it for himself because it's, have a look here, it's painted at the Vatican on the Sistine Chapel. A chapel is a church. Um, that's in the Vatican. Vatican is a little sort of almost like a state in itself in Rome. Um, and it's just dedicated to, um, you know, the sort of uh, the sort of the church. It's where the Pope lives. What do you think this work is about? What What's he glorifying? Well, it's definitely got some religious factors behind it as it's the creation of Adam and Eve or yeah. Adam basically. Yeah. It's definitely religious. It's a Christian image of um, the creation of Adam, which is like, you know, the in the, the in the Genesis section of the Bible. It's a story. It's the Genesis. It's the creation of Adam um, at the very beginning, and he's sort of glorifying that. What, when I say glorifying, what do you think makes this look quite majestic and glorified? Like it's on the ceiling of a of a church, so. Try and use your imagination. If it's on a ceiling, you know, what do you do when you look up? You're kind of looking up. And what does that kind of imply? You're looking up, you know, up to the heavens. Okay. So it's you're looking up to look at the artwork. And it's like you're looking at God and you're 
you're kind of, we're not looking at God, but looking at the creation of Adam and you're looking up towards the heavens and it's in, quite incredible. Like it's really quite a majestic work. It covers the whole ceiling and it's really beautifully painted. Like it's super, re like it looks very realistic. So what would your reaction be looking at this work? So try to so try to be a tourist looking up at this work. How would you feel? Would you be, how would you feel? Patricia, how would you feel? You'd probably feel like in awe, like you'd look up and say, wow, that's beautiful. And basically the artist is trying to make you feel sort of the power maybe of God through beauty and through the way it's painted and the beautiful composition and have a look at Adam, you know, he's Could touching. Could it also be the connection with the hands? Yeah, absolutely. Like they may be far apart, but they're always like connected in a way. Yeah, and who's who is that, do you think? Adam, God. That's, Adam, that's God, okay? So it's, you know, the connection between God and humanity could be a mm. symbol of that. It could be um, the power of God. So he's trying to make us feel about God's power through this beautiful artwork. And it's, a, you know, it is a very famous artwork. And, you know, it's just so beautifully composed, like, your eyes led from this this man, and look at the, look at his face. He's so expressive, and it goes along his arm, and then it touches just. To, and I think you've all seen that. You've probably seen, you know, the mat, the hand of God touching. You know, you've probably seen this image, or if not the whole image, you've probably seen that bit there because that's quite commonly reproduced. So it's about the power of God and religion yes. and. What yeah. style is this artwork? Like, what this is what it called? Well, it's it's actually Renaissance painting. Um, so I would call it. You could say it's painted realistically because that's really all that you would you could say. It's not an abstract work. Like, it's not unrealistic. It's painted quite realistically or naturally. It's quite natural looking. It doesn't look like he's trying to abstract it. So I just call it uh, a realistic portrayal of man and well we don't know what god looks like but he looked you know a realistic portrayal of people okay so yeah and he's so he's depicted this power and of god through realism through beautiful anatomically correct bodies you know we're in awe of how it's painted it looks 3d almost you know so yeah we're supposed to be amazed and actually we're also meant to be amazed in this artwork too. So there's sort of a common common thread through all of them is about artists making us look at our world, its beauty or its kind of, you know, consumer ugliness, I guess. But, yeah, so that's how you'd read into that world. So you can see how you could write quite a lot and it's eight marks. So, you know, you could easily write two pages on that, uh, one and a half at least. Um, with the eight mark question, but you have to write really quickly. So, um, yeah, that's that's the eight mark question. Okay. And uh, finally, this is the 12 mark one. And the question is, ooh, I made, I am. Um, okay. So, um, I took this question from another exam. So I'm actually um, in a normal exam, you'd say, okay, this must be art making practice because we haven't covered that yet. But I just realized when I use this question, it's actually um, one of the key concepts that we've already explored. So let's have a look at it. Artists often explore issues of cultural identity. What would that be? The cultural framework? Yeah, it's a cultural frame. Thank you. Good. 
cultural frame. See, that's the key word. So we might look at when and where the artist artwork was made. Does it reflect a culture? And when by culture, that could mean class, race, which means ethnic group, gender, you know, whether it's about male or females, politics, economics, could be about technology, could be about the environment, could be about an event like a war, okay? Um, you know, it could be an event like the pandemic, like that's an event, right? And I'm sure there's artworks coming out, out, out about that. Does the artwork belong to an art style or movement? For instance, can you tell what sort of artwork it is? Is it abstract, which means unrealistic? Is it realistic? Is it expressive? Is it cubist? You may not know these, these styles. You, you will know contemporary though, because it's artwork that's being made currently. You know, how does the artwork show the culture it was made in? So this artwork is very much about how it shows, um, it's very much about culture, how it shows their culture and how this one shows his culture. So these are artists that you actually are familiar with because we studied them early this year. This one, most of you aren't familiar with, but it's actually Ben Quilty, who we studied in year 10, but it doesn't matter. Uh, you, you, the, the, this particular question has even got some extracts that you should read. So you should really pay attention to everything. So let's have a look here. This is Shirin Neshat and she's from Iran. So we're kind of assuming this, this black thing on her face might be a hijab because it, Iran is a, a very sort of, um, uh, ex, sort of a fundamentalist Islam, Islamic religion. Um, and on all over her face, you can see there's kind of Arabic script or writing. Does anyone know what that is? Isn't that a gun, Miss? Yeah, it's it a gun. kind of looks like a smoke ring. Oh, it's a gun. It looks like a yeah. smoke ring from here. What did you think it was? Like a smoke ring. Like when people, like I know a lot of people that do like smoke tricks. Like it looks oh. like, like a ring. No, it's definitely, no, it's a gun. When I look at it, I think it's a fancy earring, <laughs> but it's a gun. So it's sort of like, oh, okay. It's quite, a, it's quite an ag aggressive image. Yeah, no, it's a gun. Um, and it's a photograph and it's a woman with ink writing Islamic text all over her face. And there's a little bit of information about Shirin Neshat here, which will help you answer the question. She was born in Iran, but was educated and spent most of her life in the United States. So already we know that she has um, an outsider's point of view about her culture. She knows what Western culture is like, and she also knows what her culture is like. And having been exiled from her homeland due to the Ira Iranian revolution, so exiled means she was um, she left and was not allowed to return. And um, her experiences of being displaced, which means being in another culture that doesn't belong to her, inspired her to base her artwork on the universal meanings of cultural identity, but using the symbols of Islamic martyrdom. So does anyone know what a martyr is? What, what a what is, sorry, miss? A martyr. What's martyrdom? Does anyone know what a martyr is? Isn't it like something to do with like, like a religious thing? Like, or is that wrong? Can't yeah, remember. it's when you sacrifice yourself for usually the sake of religion, even to the point where you might, um, you know, you might become a suicide bomb bomber, for instance, or kill yourself for the sake of religion. So that's what a martyr is, someone who sacrifices their life for their beliefs, okay? Um, all right. And, you know, people do that. Okay, so that's that one. This one here is Arzian. Um, and we know Arzian because we studied him as well. He makes those portrait busts out of porcelain. Um, and this is from the China China series. And it's basically a portrait bust with um, a relief which means a sculptural aspect to it of chrysanthemums 
and chrysanthemums are flowers. I think they're flowers that are used in Chinese art quite a lot. I think they're sort of, you know, they're those kind of usually yellow and orange flowers. Okay, and it says here, this is the extract for him, following the events in Tiananmen Square, that was a massacre in the 1980s and when ASEAN was a young student, ASEAN sought political asylum in Australia and moved to Sydney in 1990. He has united traditional Chinese materials and techniques with contemporary sculptural practice to address issues around his cultural identity and the relationship between East and West. So he's melded or, or fused Eastern and Western style of art. The portrait bust is a very Western style. You see a lot of Roman and even Greek sculptures use this, not Chinese, but the Chinese aspect are the chrysanthemums, the flowers. And uh, finally, we have this painting of a combi van, looks like a van um, with, a, with um, what looks like a skull attached to the front. And it's by Ben Quilty and it's very abstractly, very expressively painted, okay. Uh, ben Quilty paints the car as a living object. So he the car becomes living. Quilty believes that cars in Australia are seen as objects we desire. So he's kind of talking a little bit about Australian identity now. As an extension of the owner's identity and important for travelling around such a big country. So a little bit about cars in Australia. Um, you know, when I was growing up, you're either a Ford owner or a Holden. You either had a Holden or a Ford. And you never, ever, if you're a Holden car driver, you never bought a Ford. And if you're a Ford driver, you never bought a Holden. So that's really a very Australian sort of, Thing. Australians have a very um, strong connection with their cars. And the other connection is that Australia is big and we use them to drive around. So, yeah, so for, to go on holidays and things like that. So what is he saying about Australian culture? What is ASEAN saying about his culture being a Western, being an Eastern or a Chinese person living in Australia? And what is Shirin Neshat saying about her original culture now living in the United States. So what do you think these artworks are saying about issues of cultural identity? What are some things that they're saying? Does anyone want to make suggestions with the first I one? Think, I think yeah. for the first one, like it's talking about like kind of stereotypes, like mm -hmm. I don't know, like because it's talking about cultural um like things and I think it's more talking about how like if you're Middle Eastern now you're immediately labeled like a terrorist and you're immediately labeled all of these like horrid and like very just disgusting terms and it yeah. just happens all over the world absolutely like, yeah. yeah good yeah you could talk about how um cultures are labeled um and their stereotypes of cultures um, and what's the stereotype here? We have the gun, so martyrdom and violence. We know that, um, in, and, and in the name of religion too, because we're sort of assuming, I think it actually says it's, it's Islamic text, but it doesn't say that it's from the Quran, but we can assume that it is, okay? Um, and, yeah, and it's also a woman's face too. So there's also the... Um, it's, it's talking about her cultural identity, right, that she's Islamic and the stereotypes attached to that and the fact that, oh, you know, they, they, they're suicide bombers and they kill themselves or they kill others as well. But it also she's a female as well. So there's another layer. There's also her gender identity. So identity doesn't have to be just religious or cultural. It can also be... Uh, male and female. So if we go back to we go back to the cultural frame, does it reflect a culture? And it says here gender. You can also it can also be about gender and politics as well, or a particular event for that matter. So I would definitely say it's also 
um, looking at stereotypes of maybe women in Islam and, you know, not being having any power. Does anyone want to add to that? I mean, does she look happy in this work? Like she's sort of quite... So it's almost like she's sort of asking for help. So you can talk about that too, okay? And she's used photography to do that. She's used that image of the gun, which is a powerful symbol of death and threatening. And then you've got this sort of writing, sort of covering her face even the way that the, the writing is all over her face, what does that say? Like, you know, it's almost like it's, a ta it's tattooed on her face. What could that be a symbol of about identity? <clears throat> could you read into that? Could you talk about how identity is inseparable from us, okay, and often it totally takes over us or takes over our lives where you know we there is no other way to do things so this this writing the way it's placed all over her face could be a symbol of how you know she's almost trapped in her identity okay and there's no escape so you can really read into it so if you get stuck just think about it think about the way think about why did she put writing all over her face like you know what does that suggest to you it's almost um, that identity. When we were learning about ASEAN, for instance, we were talking about the indelibility of identity. And indelible, you know, like an indelible marker is just a fancy word for permanent marker. So our identity is indelible. It's permanent. We can't really escape it. And, you know, having something all over your face, almost like a tattoo, you can't escape that. So there's that as well. Um, when we look at ASEAN, again, this chrysanthemum, which is a very Chinese symbol, I'm pretty sure. Um, I'm just going to look up Chinese art. Chinese art. There we go, came up straight away. Yeah, so if you look at some images of Chinese paintings, they do love the chrysanthemums. You might not be aware of that, but ASEAN paints dragons and all sorts of stuff as well. So there you go, chrysanthemums. Are, and I don't know what they symbolise, actually, but it doesn't matter. We do know that it's, um, it's Chinese because it's, it tells us anyway. So we've got this information here, you know, um, that he um, uses Western techniques um, and ch traditional Chinese materials as well. So porcelain, porcelain is, is also Chinese, you know, all those vases that you see with sort of Chinese, the, you know, the blue vases, they're all that sort of. So you kind of have to understand that as well. Uh, so he's fusing the two together. What's he saying about his identity? He now lives in Sydney. And this is something you should be able, you should all be able to relate to because you all have two identities, you all have two cultural identities. You know, you're Australian, you're born here, but you're still Greek. Like, is there anyone not Greek in this class? So, no. So you can't escape that. Like, no matter what, it's there and it's your, it, it will always be there. So it, cultural identity is really strong. So, yes, you identify with being Australian, but you can't escape your Greek identity either. And it's not just about, you know, where your parents were born. It's more than that. It's in you. So, you know, I think this work basically says that. It kind of says he can't escape his Chinese identity, this, this symbol of his Chineseness, which in this case is, the porcelain and the sort of flowers is all over his face and the eyes are closed. So what might that symbolise? <clears throat> I 
What might that symbolize? Any suggestions? Which image, Miss? This one here. Oh, am I am I on the right page? Yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah it's just my screen. Okay, it's this one here. here. One thing you notice. So don't don't let anything go. When you see when you look at an artwork, think, oh look, the eyes are closed. You know, make a suggestion. What could that mean? When we when our eyes are closed, what could that mean? I don't know. Like, are we helpless, or you know, are we blind, or are we somehow? Well, I guess we don't see what's going on around us. Yeah, sometimes our and identity. Awareness. Yeah, yeah, good. You can talk about that. You can talk about um, how identity sometimes um, limits our awareness of other things that, you know, other ways of doing things. Like you can read a lot into it. And as long as you can support it by saying the eyes are closed, therefore suggesting that, you know, we're blind or lack an awareness of, other things like you can really read into it and and make your own meanings and because it because it's postmodern you can actually do that and the artist does encourage you to read into an artwork and perhaps bring meaning into it that the artist didn't even think of so we talked about postmodernism the other day and how there's layers and multiple layers of meaning then to them sort of encouraging you to do that to look into the work and think what could it mean um, it's also about his fusion of both eastern and western cultures you know now he's in australia he's both australian but he's still chinese and he'll never let go of that so it's very much about the inescapable inescapability or the indelible nature of culture we can't remove it it's stuck on us forever forever okay and the final work is this great big ugly <laughs> car very expressive and it's about it's about Aussie identity what's it saying I mean it's not the car's got a skull on the skull on the front so what what is he saying what could he be saying I think he's kind of talking about how Australia like especially is really big on like cars and how like it, they're, they're more of like an adrenaline thing like mm. really like it's like an adrenaline like I don't know how to explain it. like we're yeah. adrenaline junkies like I don't know how to explain it yeah probably. yeah yes and sometimes what happens with people in cars when they're sort of you know take them to their ultimate sort of function which is to drive and drive fast a lot of deaths happen in cars too. Um, so does maybe it, for me the kind of the skull suggests you know people dying in cars as well. I mean I don't know. That's what I kind of get out of it. And also the yeah. And also um, I think because it's got a face on it, um, it's almost sort of saying how important cars are to people, especially in Australia and the males especially. It like it's real car and identity like it gives it an identity yeah yeah it's a sort of um it's it um what do you call it is it anthropomorph you know when you add a, a what do you call it in english when you add human characteristics to an object personification what is it personification yeah you could put personification so adding sort of creating a human character and in a way it's sort of um, says a lot about how important cars are because they're like part of the family. They're like another person. So you can read into that. Like I read into initially deaths in cars. That was my experience of looking at this. And, you know, um, when you said adrenaline, I thought, yeah, people love to speed, you know, especially uh, car junkies. Like that's what they love cars for. It's, it's how fast they go. But it's also about using a van for traveling all over Australia. It could be that because let's face it, Australia is big and we like to go on holidays and we often drive to places and, you know, Aussies like to camp. So it could be that. Okay, I'm just bringing different meanings. And then there's the personification, giving it human character to suggest that cars, you know, in, in Australian culture, cars are often like, they're like part of the family and, you know, 
they're really important. So, and we hold them very dear to us, especially in a male Aussie culture. And I know Davina, your family are really into car. So you know exactly what I mean. So that's really something that is, there's a real strong culture in Australia with cars. Um, and I think that's what Ben Quilty is painting about because he's a young male too. And um, yeah, and then the aggressive way he's painted it, I guess, what do you think? Why is he, why is he painting so expressively? What does that mean? Like, for me, it's quite violent work, but I read violence into it. Anything else? Does anyone want to suggest anything? I don't, I don't really see violence. I see it more as like an expression of like, like kind of who like people are. Because I know like for me and for my family, the first, when people think of us, the first thing they think of is like the GT or like yeah. any car. Yeah. That's the first thing that I always think of, even with most of the people in my family. Yes. So I think it's more of a thing where it's like, even like, like the use of colors in kind of, like it's it's not really like scary in a way it's more of like a um like a vibe there's like a vibrancy to it that just adds this kind of like it just adds like this anonymous identity that so many people take over especially in Australia within yeah. like our community and GTs and just everything like that okay so you think that the painting makes it look vibrant and special and and uh, more individual than than just a sort of, um, you know, like Andy Warhol's work, which is very, it's almost photographic. So maybe it gives it a bit of character perhaps. Yeah. Um, some human expression. Yeah, you could definitely talk about that too. Yes. And there is a kind of expressive quality that you, when you think of a car or a painting of a car, you don't expect it to be painted that way. So it gives it almost yeah, maybe a more human emotional quality. It gives, it certainly makes it emotional. So yeah, perhaps he's uh, giving the car human characteristics, including emotions and feelings and a face. So can you see how you can really read into an image? And um, as long as you support what you say, you, you know, you're fine. So talking about the emotion, emotional expressive qualities of the paint, um, you could say, well, that's a metaphor for how we portray cars as being, you know, part of the family and having emotions and feelings, and that's how special they are to us. So, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Okay. Oh, it's, oh, have we gone over time? Okay. <laughs> so there you go. That is section one, guys. I oh, didn't realise. What time does the bell go? Four minutes ago. <laughs> okay. I think we did that pretty well. So, yeah, there you go. So that's section one and it's half the exam. And so you shouldn't spend more than 45 minutes on the on this whole section, question one, two, and three. And then the other 45 minutes would be your essay. So next revision lesson, we're going to look at the still paragraph again and look at Miss, some. Are you going to put today's lesson up on Canvas? I'll like do that. Recording? Yeah, okay. it's a long recording. So just be patient. I will put it up. You didn't miss yeah. out on very much, but I'll put it up for you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, guys. Thank you. And um, I shall see you soon. Bye. Thank you. See Bye. You. Bye. Bye, Miss. See ya. Bye, Miss. Bye.